Hi everyone, welcome to Five Quote Shakespeare, Twelfth Night, Act Four, Scene One. What I do in this series is I first give you a nutshell overview of the important plot events of each scene, and then we dive deeply into the text of each scene and pull out five or more quotes that I think are useful to help you understand the play's character, theme, and plot. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and if you make a donation, you'll get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. We are approaching the climax of the play, and this scene ratchets up the insanity, the chaos. We've got three cases of mistaken identity, three comedy of errors that we can map out. The first one is between Feste and Sebastian. So on the street, Feste encounters, he catches up with uh, Sebastian and off stage they had been talking and Feste has been trying to convince Sebastian to come visit o Olivia because Olivia has requested it. Uh, mistaking Sebastian for Cesario Viola, Feste says Olivia wants to see him and is puzzled that Sebastian is pretending not to know him. So there's a lot of tension. The scene opens with tension and uh, Sebastian is really irritated with Feste for, uh, for bothering them. This stranger comes up and starts hassling you to go and visit this lady who you don't know. So irritated, Sebastian tells Feste to leave him alone in no uncertain terms. So the second comedy of errors is between Sir Andrew and Sir Toby, they enter and Andrew strikes Sebastian thinking that Sebastian is Caesarea. Remember, Sir Toby and Fabian have egged Sir Andrew on to challenge uh, uh, Viola Cesario to, uh, to, to a duel uh, to prove his manhood so that Olivia would, would, would respect him and love him. So, however, this is not Viola Cesario. This is Sebastian, who is a real man, and he, he strikes back. And the cowardly uh, Andrew threatens to report him to the authorities for a th assault, so he demonstrates his cowardice very, very surely. Uh, Toby tries to restrain Sebastian, and there is a bit of a scuffle. Now, the third, she enters, Olivia enters, and shoes these ruffians away. Uh, and this is where we get the third comedy of errors. Uh, Olivia enters, chastises the time waster Toby for brawling and sends the ruffians away. And then Olivia apologizes profusely to someone who she thinks is uh, Cesario. Uh, and she repeats her previous de declared love and pleads with him to enter her house. So absolutely shocked, but pleasantly so. Because remember, um, uh, Olivia is, is quite beautiful and she's a noble woman. So she's a, she's a good catch. And so he's, he's pleasantly shocked by this. And he actually agrees to be ruled by Olivia and they enter the house and things unfold after that. So let's have a quick look at dramatic narrative form. One of the subplots of course involves Toby's manipulations of Andrew for his own entertainment, his own amusement, and that is foiled in this particular scene. Toby's manipulations are interrupted by the main plot elements because Olivia rushes onto the stage and defends Sebastian, who she thinks is Cesario, who was actually Viola. So do you see what I mean about chaos? Uh, in terms of the main plot, we get, the, we get a big complication here, obviously. Olivia mistakes Sebastian for Cesario Viola, and that's delicious dramatic irony. And the fact that Sebastian agrees to follow Olivia into her home uh, uh, really, really ratchets up the anticipation. We're wondering how on earth this is going to, uh, how, how it's going to unfold. Uh, uh, anticipation is also heightened here because we see Sebastian drawing closer and closer and closer to another one of the, the, the main plots, which is the satisfaction of Viola's desire to reunite with her long lost brother. Okay, so short but complicated scene. Let's get into the text. As I said, Sebastian is getting pretty irritated with Feste for hassling him to go meet this lady that he's never seen before and Feste in his turn and in his passive aggressive manner is getting kind of irritated too and he says well okay well if you aren't Cesario then I'm not sent by my lady which he was and this isn't my nose and nothing is what it is that's what he says here he says nothing that is so is so if you aren't Cesario well he isn't Cesario so even Feste is being fooled here by the grand old theme of appearance versus reality so this is this is a reminder that yes this whole play is built on deceptions and deceptions uh, uh, for our comedic uh, enjoyment, yes. However, I've argued, and I'm going to argue in just a moment, that these deceptions are actually quite satan satanic in their nature. Uh, so, yes, appearance versus reality, deception, equivocation, riddles, wordplay, puns, and disguise, and Feste's reminding us of that. Uh, 
pay attention to that because in the very next scene, this is repeated again. And so the significance is, is compounded. Uh, this related to this is another quote down here. Uh, Feste, again, getting irritated, but because he's a, he's a com comic, he's passive aggressive and he does it through humor and irony. And he says, come on, man, I prithee now, ungird thy strangeness. Now that's kind of some weird old vocabulary here, but what it basically means is stop your st strange behavior, stop your play acting, stop your deceptions. So do you see the significance of that line? It's a neat little throwaway line. Like Shakespeare's plays are full of these neat little throwaway lines that are packed with meaning once you slow down and think about them. So that to me suggests the grand theme of manipulation, which is connected to appearance versus reality. Dramatically ironic call. This is a dramatically ironic call to end Olivia's play acting. Olivia, her deceptions from the very beginning of the story have 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 involved all of these people's the people in tortures throughout the whole play so far so he's he he's he doesn't know what he's saying here but he actually is he's calling on and we the audience pick up on this it's like yeah come on hurry up viola end your deceptions end your play acting ungird thy strangeness so we can resolve this comedy and everybody can be happy and i can go home satisfied so it's an it's a it's a Dramatically ironic call to end Viola's play acting, her deceptions, her manipulations of everyone in this play. Here's the question I'd like to ask you, and you can answer it yourself. Is Viola the hero healing the wasteland, or is she one of the other satanic deceivers causing the wasteland? I've argued in, uh, in, in previous videos, go back and watch my, my theme videos and, and the character videos, and you'll, you'll see more of this, uh, that, that it is a, there's a wasteland. It really is a wasteland. Everybody's wasting their lives. Everybody's, uh, there's sleeping beauties. There's time wasters. So Toby is a drunken time waster. Uh, and, and, and the land requires a hero to heal it and bring vitality and energy back into the world. And Viola is that character. However, uh, put in this light, you can think of her as one of the, and oh, and I've argued also that, that Toby, Toby and Mariah are satanic figures. Uh, Shakespeare repeats uh, images of Satan and hell throughout this whole play and in association with deceptions. And so uh, 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 Mariah, especially Toby too, are associated with the satanic, uh, the, the satanic deceiver so but is the ultimate satanic deceiver viola because she she's the cause of this she's she's the center of this hurricane do you see her her deceptions and she's causing olivia a lot of grief okay so something to think about um this also foreshadows the approaching reveal scene we all know that of course at the end of a comedy at the end of a tragedy too all strangeness is eventually ungirded Enough is enough, says Sebastian. I'm tired of you, fool. Please leave. But before he does, remember the fool is a fool. It, that, that, it's a job. It's a job to, to, to banter with people and to, make, and to entertain people. And that's kind of what Feste does here, even though he's trying to get Sebastian to do something that Sebastian doesn't want to do. Uh, so you can imagine if you're hassled on the street by this clown who comes up and, 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 and tries to pull you away wittily, but still he's hassling you. So Sebastian does what he has to do. Uh, he pays him money. He, he does the good thing and he pays the fool for doing uh, uh, what, the, what, what the fool's job is to do. However, then he says, if you tarry longer, I shall give worse payment. So he's going to, to, to take care of business the way he, he has to. Now, that reveals that Sebastian is courageous. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's going to stand up for himself. He's not going to let himself get drawn, get, get, get drawn into whatever this guy wants him to do. He's courageous. He's direct. He's open. He's self-possessed. Listen to the language. It's the language. Now, we're going we're gonna to contrast that language to Sir Andrews down here. Okay, and you'll see the difference. Shakespeare always, not always, he very, very often works in contrasts. Uh, a lot of art does, of course. So here we see Sebastian being courageous, direct, open, self-possessed. He knows what he is, and he knows who he is. There's no pretending here. There's no passive aggressive hiding uh, at all. Uh, and he, and at, on top of that, he's generous. He knows what a, a fool's job is and he, he pays him and says, okay, that's it. I've done my part. You've done your part. Let's part. Okay. Uh, so again, we could, we could wrap in the theme of appearance versus reality here. There is no deception. There is no equivocating. There is no passive aggressiveness. There's no messing around in these words. It's the tone of the words. No deception, equivocations, riddles, wordplays, puns, disguises. It's strongly contrasted with Toby and we could say also uh, Feste's passive aggressiveness. Uh, that's, how the, that's how clowns work. Uh, comedians are very often quite passive aggressive, which I don't think it reveals cowardice necessarily, but, but 
passive aggressive insults are, are more cowardly than direct insults because they don't they, they give you a cover you don't you're not going to get punched in the face if you just say hey it's only a joke so so there's that there's that now, uh, so there, again, is the Wasteland theme. Here we see the approaching worthy hero, one of the two. Viola, as I've argued, uh, as I've argued before, Viola is the initiating uh, worthy hero who arrives in Aurelia to, to cure the Wasteland. But as I've also argued in other videos, that Sebastian and Viola are basically the same character. They demonstrate the same personality traits all throughout this. They're the male-female versions of the same person it's really really clever it's really really cool so here is the approaching worthy hero come to heal the wasteland now this quote here supports what we've just talked about uh sir sir andrew enters and sir toby belch and with fabian and then sir andrew uh strikes strikes him uh to 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 get the brawl going that that was that was the manipulation uh, uh coming from uh, toby and fabian well how does the hero respond not like Sir Andrew responds here, but he responds like the true hero. He says, okay, fine. Well, you gave me, there's for me, fine, and here's for you, and there, and there. So he, re he, he returns what he gets. And again, there's the, that's the, the masculine, the positive masculine energy standing up for himself, which is in strong contrast to uh, the cowardly, unworthy Sir Andrew, which we'll talk about now. Toby is grappling with Sebastian and Andrew says, okay, no, 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 leave him alone, leave him alone. I'll go another way to work with him. I'll, I'll have an action of battery against him. He's going to go to the law, do you see, even though he struck uh, Sebastian first, but no matter, Sir Andrew's a fool. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So do you see what's happening here? There's a strong contrast between this cowardly, unworthy behavior. He, he's going to go in another way. That's interesting. It's, it's indirectness. He's hiding behind the law in a similar way that Feste hides behind uh, his, his humor, you see. It's really complex. Nothing is what it is in this play, in a lot of Shakespeare's plays. It's, it's so close to real life. There's a lot of hidden meanings behind uh, what, what seems to be simple on the outside. So there's a strong contrast between the unworthy hero and the worthy hero. Again, it's part of the Wasteland theme. It's part of the Hero's Quest theme. Go back and have a look at that. And then Olivia enters to spoil all of Toby's fun. Now it's Olivia's turn to have enough. She says, hold, hold stop sir toby stop this brawl she breaks it up she she thinks she's defending the person that she loves and ironically it turns out to be the person that she loves uh she, she what she's doing here it's a wonderful quote uh she, it is it's a, it's a it's a mini climax here it's a moment where olivia's had enough of the of the of the time waster of the uncivilized behavior of 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 sir toby sir toby she says here she says will it ever be thus Ungrace, ungracious wretch, fit for the mountains and the barbarous caves where manners ne'er were preached. So there's a calling out. Olivia is emerging here as a hero, as I'm going to argue, a tough-minded matriarch. She's worthy of her position of responsibility, and she recognizes those who are unworthy, and Toby certainly is unworthy. Now, again, go back and watch my theme video. I talk a lot about the hero's quest, the, the worthy heroes in the hero's journey, and, and baseness and nobility, and it's, it's the noble. It's, it's a hard harmony between the noble and the base, the high and the low, that makes a great hero. And we see too much of the base in guys like Toby. Uh, so Sir Toby is depicted here as, as a man-child, even more, more well, yes, a man-child as well, but a man-beast too, because the caves and the barbarous, the, uh, the mountains and the barbarous caves uh, suggest to me, if he is a man-child, he's the Peter Pan. And where does Peter Pan spend his time? off gallivanting in the hills and playing cowboys and Indians in the wild zones of Neverland, in the Neverland world of irresponsibility, do you see? He is uncivilized. Peter Pan and, and, and Toby are uncivilized, unsocialized into, the, into worthy manhood. They're not men. They're not real men. They're not worthy men. They are unworthy. And in these scenes here, it's all coming to a climax, the contrast between the worthy and the unworthy. Uh, really, really quite interesting. So we see, yes, we see nobility versus baseness. Toby is uncivilized. He's living the unconsidered life of an animal, seeking only immediate needs and desire gratification. Do you see what I'm saying? His, his joking around here, you know, his, his, his manipulations of Sir Andrew are all these childish amusements, and that's how he spends his life. Okay, you feel pain, you get drunk, and you don't feel pain anymore. That, that's, an un, that's the unconsidered life. Uh, uh, that, he, that he's living. He's unworthy. So that's the theme of time wasting. I talk about that a lot. That's the dominant theme of the whole play. Go back and watch my theme video. It's there. Excess versus moderation. There's nothing wrong with having fun. 
but you go too far. You can tease your friends, sure, and they should tease you back, but you do what he, the, what Toby is doing to poor Sir Andrew, and that's certainly excess. It's cruelty. It's not fun anymore. It's cruelty. Uh, the Hero's Journey, we've talked about that. Toby as unworthy hero. And Olivia is emerging as the hero. She's intelligent, wise, she's civilized. She's properly socialized into her position of responsibility. She's a worthy, tough-minded matriarch. She really, really is. And that's repeated in scenes below. Go come watch my, fault, my, my the videos I'm going to do next, and I show how, how Olivia really, really handles herself. And that's one of the reasons why uh, Sebastian falls in love with her, because he admires her competence in that way. So really, really interesting quote here. Things coming to a head in terms of uh, uh, Olivia's tolerance of the time-wasting, unworthy Toby. Okay, so, and then they are alone. Olivia is rightly ashamed of her uncle's behavior, and she's afraid that it, it reflects badly on her family. So she's trying to impress Sebastian here, well, a viol, a Cesario, really. Uh, and so she tries to, she, she just explains his, his stupid behavior. And then she says at the end, she says, Bestrew his soul for me. Uh, he started one poor heart of mine in thee. So she says, uh, kind of forgive my, my, my erratic behavior back there, uh, but he frightened me. He frightened my heart, which is in your heart. So there's an old notion of, of, of when lovers fall in love, they exchange hearts. And that's, that's significant, and, and, it's, and the significance is repeated at the very, very end here. It has to do with the divine marriage, the, the old notion of the union of opposites of male and female. Uh, it, it's really quite clever and really quite beautiful, actually, and Shakespeare uh, uh, explores this theme in a lot of his plays. And so the rhyme, the end rhyme of me and thee, it suggests a union. Uh, end rhyme is not an accident. It's not just for musical. It doesn't just ring in the ear. It, it should, a good poem will, will use rhyme to actually make connections okay so 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 that's interesting right there she's she's in love and it sounds like it's kind of a deep love uh, it's with the wrong person it's with Sebastian instead of Cesario Viola but as I've argued they are the same character Sebastian and Viola are the male female versions of the same personality uh, okay, so Sebastian, uh, Sebastian's like, what you you love me? What what's going on? I've never met you. You love me? Wow! And in an aside, he says, "What taste is this? What what's what's the taste of this situation? What what relish is in this? How runs the situation? How runs the stream? Or am I mad? Or else this is a dream?" And he says, "Okay, so that that's quite obvious." Okay, then he says, "Let fancy, let my imagination, shut my senses of reason up." Let fancy still my sense, and in Lethe steep. Now, Lethe is the river, is in ancient Greece, it was the river of forgetfulness. So let me steep myself, let me dip myself in the river of forgetness, forgetfulness rather. If it be so, if it be thus to dream, still let me sleep. If this is a dream, if I'm mad, I'm going to stay here in this dream, in this never, never land. Are we back to the time wasters again? So clever here. The theme, love is a call to life. It's the dual nature of emotion, feeling, and love and beauty. Love is a call to life. We've seen that in the whole play that calls this guy out tragically to love, but ultimately to, to success. It, call, it doesn't call out the losers, and that's where the, the tragedy lies in this tragic comedy. Love is a call to life. It's calling Olivia out to life for sure, but it's also a potential destroyer as all of this stuff uh, uh, suggests, all of this, this, this chaos suggests nothing is what, what seems to be the case, and that's the potential destruction. Uh, love can be a will-o'-the-wisp. Uh, 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 it can cause the, the, it can cause victims. Uh, the will of the wisp. Remember, go back and watch my theme video. It's the the swamp gas that ignites at night. And if you're wandering in the swamp late at night in the in the, in the swamps of northern Europe, and you see this light, uh, you think it's a house, and so you go towards it. But it's only this methane gas being released in the swamps, and it can lead you to your doom. So is love that? Certainly, it is, ladies and gentlemen. You probably have experienced it. Uh, is love uh, an, an entrance into the lotus-eating, uh, a time-wasting realm like Orsino? And again, go back and watch my theme video. The lotus eaters were from Greek mythology. Odysse Odysseus arrives with his crew on an island of the lotus eaters, and they're tempted to just lie around and eat this narcotic plant that just l l allows them to exist in a in a, 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 a static state of 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 paralysis really blissed out paralysis a drugged out blissed out paralysis well what's sebastian calling for here blissed out drugged out you know 
bliss uh, in love. So there's a big question here about whether or not, I mean, th there he is, there's the lotus eater here. Uh, however, he, he, this, this was a self-indulgent uh, lotus eating. He was, he was in love with, with, with someone who, didn't, who, who, who was impossible to, uh, to, to attain. And so he was adolescently in love with, with his emotions rather than with uh, um, Olivia at all. So there's the dual nature of emotion and feeling and beauty, the dual nature of that. It can be a deceptive will of the wisp. Uh, it can love as a kind of madness. Now, poets have been saying that since forever. Uh, uh, beauty and love can be a narcotic. Yes, we've been saying that since forever, and here it is again. Uh, time wasting. Uh, blind attraction to beauty leads to ruin. Now, look, I've got all these question marks in bold here because I really don't know. And it does, well, I do know because at the very, very end, no, it's not. Love is what revitalizes the world. And we're going to see that. But the, the course to true love never did run smooth, as, as Shakespeare says in uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. We're seeing the rough patches here. We have to go through the tortures before we emerge. And some people don't emerge. So for some people, it is a will o' the wisp. Okay, for 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 poor old, you know, this guy here, his love was a well, it wasn't love, of course, but his attraction to Olivia was a will o' the wisp, and it ended up ended up, you know, he led him into a swamp of nothingness. Uh, Sebastian is Sebastian uh, Odysseus in the land of the Lotus Eaters. It's quite similar. He's arrived by ship to this land of all these crazy characters and insanity, and he sees love and he's tempted to, 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 to spend the rest of his life there? Uh, um, no, ultimately no, but a very, very interesting questions that Shakespeare's posing here. Okay, so more of the holy divine marriage in the very, very end here. The poetics, the mechanics of language here, the mechanics of poetry reinforce what I've just been talking about here. The final two lines of this are, Ne come I prithee, would thou would thou be ruled by me? Madame, I will, O oh, say so, and so be. That's actually one line. This is actually one line, but it's Shakespeare will divide it like this if he needs to split it up. Now, it is iambic pentameter. It's varied iambic pentameter. It's not perfect iambic pentameter, but the core of it is. Uh, so, so, but he makes some adjustments here. The fact that these two lines are, are, are united suggests the union between Sebastian and Olivia. Okay, uh, Sebastian and Olivia's lines are unified into one varied iambic pentameter line. That suggests to me the union of the two, the marriage of true minds that we've talked about in other videos, and that's that's a line from one of Shakespeare's sonnets, and the divine sacred marriage. Uh, as as I've said here, there was an old uh, alchemical, medieval alchemical notion that the, that the male and the female individuals are representative of the divine, the cosmic male and female principles of the universe. And their union is truly a union. It's not just a meeting. It's actually a union. They become one. That's what it means. Uh, and so that's the, that's, and, and that is what heals the wasteland, the sacred divine union of the king of heaven and the queen of heaven. Uh, it has to take place or the universe crumbles. Uh, it, that, that's seen throughout a lot of literature. And it's, a, it's kind of a neat idea because if men and women today, if men and women don't get together, civilization crumbles because we don't, because we don't have any more babies. So anyway, so there's the wasteland. The union of opposites dispels the chaos that we see throughout this whole play. It restores order to the wasteland, and that is the cosmic, social, psychological harmony that that love is bringing to the end of this play. Said the several loves uh, uh, bring that harmony. Really, really cool idea, and we see that as I said in the union of these two lines. It's not it's not an accident. Now you might think you know I'm overthinking it. All my students always say, oh you're overthinking it. You're just, that's just an accident. It's not. It's not. A great poem is like a, is like, go, go look at a BMW engine or, or a Bentley engine. Look under the hood and look how complex that engine is. Well, poetry is very much like that kind of machine. All of the parts are pointing in one direction. For the Bentley, it's speed. Okay. And for, 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 for a poem, it's all pointing towards different themes. And everything that we've, a lot of what we've seen in this play so far leads in this direction that love a, a divine love, a marriage of true minds can heal the chaos, the personal chaos, the social chaos, and mythologically speaking throughout history, we've imagined this as a kind of cosmic chaos. It's, it's really, really, really cool stuff. Uh, there's also the, the, the oh, this is brilliant as well. The end rhyme here, again, is no accident. The end rhyme on me and B, what does that suggest? Olivia being, Olivia becoming. Olivia awakening, 
Sleeping Beauty Awakening. It's absolutely gorgeous. The end rhyme on me and B is Olivia the me coming into existence. What is bringing her into existence? Love. That's what does it. It's so neat. Love is called to life. Absolutely called to life. So we, we were questioning love up here, the dangers of love. And that's very, very, very real. And Shakespeare makes that very clear in a lot of his plays. But here we see the potential of love, the positive potential of love. Sleeping Beauty awakes, the, 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 the worm in the cocoon exiting the cocoon and becoming the butterfly. Gorgeous. And that was Five Quote Shakespeare, Act 4, Scene 1. Hope you found it useful. If you did, please like and subscribe and pick up a copy of your PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.